Muy buenos días. Un saludo al misionero Miguel Hermudo Marín y a todos los ministros, hermanos. Good morning. Greetings to the missionary Miguel Bermúdez Marín and to all the ministers, brothers and sisters, gathered today, Saturday, July 20th of this year 2024. For those who will be gathered today, Saturday, And for those who will be listening and reading this greeting of this occasion later on, you may please be seated. I wanted to share with you in this morning, it is from the topic, Time Will Be No More, preached on July 12, 2009 by our brother William Soto Santiago. They're in Cali, Colombia. And he tells us here. And now, we can see that there is a great blessing in the kingdom of the Messiah. A kingdom that will be established on earth, where there will be justice, peace, and happiness for the human being. Now, before all that happens, Christ has to finish his work of intercessor as high priest in heaven. Come out, take that book. He has to do it as lion of the tribe of Judah. He has to make that change. And when that happens, there will no longer be blood in heaven to make intercession and cleanse the person from all sin. There you can see that while he was preaching salvation under the dispensation of grace, he was not carrying out the claiming work as the lion of the tribe of Judah. God is an orderly God. And he was carrying out his work of redemption through the preaching of the gospel of the grace. And that work of redemption was carried out for 2,000 years under that preaching, taking the gospel of the grace and giving people the opportunity to obtain salvation and eternal life. And while he was carrying out that work, He had not yet risen because up to the last chosen one had to enter, had to be cast, or God cast that person into the blood, be cast into the blood of Christ, shed on Calvary's cross, and be cleansed from all sin. And thus the person obtain the new birth, be baptized in water, and thus obtain the new birth. Now notice, all of that happened under the dispensation of grace. Now, for him to carry out the claiming work and to come as lion of the tribe of Judah, the dispensation of grace had to be closed. So at that time, that interlace had to be fulfilled with that messenger who would be closing the dispensation of grace and opening a new dispensation, but no longer as lamb, but as lion, and thus carry out the claiming work. Now notice what it says here. He goes on to say, then when that happens, that is, when he rises from the throne of the Father, takes the title deed, and comes as lion of the tribe of Judah, he says. Then when that happens, there will no longer be blood in heaven to make intercession and cleanse the person from all sin. Christ will have already finished that work as it happened when the high priest finished his work in the temple and left. The one who was forgiven and reconciled with God had the right to continue living. The one who had not repented, it was too late when the high priest finished his work. 
So it will be for every human being who will be living in this end time. Now, in Revelation chapter 5, he takes a book and opens it in heaven. In chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. And then, in chapter 10, he descends to earth with the little book open in his hand to speak, to cry out as when a lion roars. In other words, to speak no longer as a lamb or as a high priest, but as a lion. And as a lion, he is the king and judge, and he cries out, he speaks, and seven thunders utter their voices. For those who say that all this has already been fulfilled in Brother William, no, he did all of that. You see, when you don't have the revelation from above, when you do not have that prophetic insight, they try to place everything that the messenger has brought and they place it under their own interpretation. Those are private interpretations. But God has promised in His Word that at the end of time, He would send His angels, that is, those ministries, to bring separation, the segregation, and to say which is true and what is the truth and what is wrong. Let us see. In His Word, He promised it. Because among so many human interpretations, there has to be a true one. Notice, on page 141, paragraph 1260, it says, Notice in verse 41, Matthew 13, The two also very close, so close in the last days till he didn't do. He could not depend on some certain church to separate them. In other words, no denomination. And no church that says he has the truth. And the minister stands up and say, no, it means this way, in that way, and this way. And I'm going to do it my way with the group, my way. Because this is what I believe it's so. If he doesn't have the ministries of Moses and Elijah, he cannot on his own bring the revelation to the people. Then God, notice, has to send those angels. What for? Notice, he could not depend on some certain church to separate them, say the Methodist or the Baptist or the Pentecostals to separate them. He said he sends his angels to separate them. An angel is coming to bring the separation, the segregation between right and wrong. And no one can do that but the angel of the Lord. In other words, it's not that there is a lot of people of ministers saying, no, this is like this, and others saying that's like way. No, there is only one, the angel of the Lord. It is the Holy Spirit operating in the ministries of Moses and Elijah, bringing the separation, the segregation, and saying what is right and what is wrong. As simple as that. You want to seek the truth? Look for the angel of the Lord in his final manifestation, and there you will find the truth. And it was promised that the angel of the Lord, the pillar of fire, the angel of the covenant, will be in a great tent cathedral, speaking to his church, bringing the rapturing faith. See how simple everything is? He is the one that is going to tell which is right and which is wrong. God said he will send his angels at the last times. Not angels down through here, but angels at the last time, and would gather together. In other words, he also carries out that work of gathering, of harvest. In other words, to do that work for which he came for, to make the claim, that is, to claim all that he redeemed with his precious blood. We know that this is the coming harvest time now, In other words, that will take place, see? He was saying there that that would be a time of harvest. Now, an angel is actually interpreted a messenger. Wherever he speaks, the angel of the Lord, that manifestation of the angel is there in the instrument that is currently alive in the time in which the person is living. It cannot be the fulfillment of of those prophecies in a messenger that is already gone. It has to be in the messenger that is alive in the midst of the human race. Now, an angel 
is actually interpreted a messenger. And we see that there is seven angels of the seven churches, and now, no, through the church ages. There is where he writes, he will send his angels in the separation, Moses and Elijah, the gathering and harvest. Notice, that is the work of those ministries. Now he keeps saying, It's the message of Christ for a new dispensational day. It's the gospel of the kingdom to be preached again by Christ through human instrumentality. And he brings the little book open in his hand and gives it to a man to eat it. Notice, if it is through human instrumentality, when he takes the title deed, comes down from heaven and gives it to a man, then there's got to be a prophet, a messenger, and that messenger is a dispensational prophet who is in the midst of his church to carry out that claiming work and seven thunders to utter their voices. That did not happen before. In other words, during the dispensation of grace, which is the holy place. Now notice, that is what Adam had to wait for so that that tree of life would become flesh in order to eat. Now notice in the book of the ages, here in the red one is 112, and on the other one it's 109. Notice what it tells us there. Where the paragraph begins, it says, Men could not directly come and partake of the tree of life in the midst of the garden. That eternal life of the tree had to become flesh first. There to the right, he draws a star of David. And he writes, Revelation 19, 11 to 21. And that is the coming of the white horse rider. 17, 14, and 10, 1 to 11. There in those places is the coming of the Lord. In other words, notice he is placing there what it means that this eternal life had to become flesh. Now remember let us see here. Let's turn to, on a moment, turn to the book of quotations. Because notice that he tells us, let us see here quickly where he shows us that of the two portions. On page 69, paragraph 597, it says, And as Elijah went down to Jordan one day and struck it with Elisha, and he parted back, and he crossed over. He come back, and he writes, Second Elijah equals Elisha. He come back with a double portion. And when we strike Jordan with Christ, we got one portion. But when we return... We're coming with two portions. We got eternal life, resurrection from sin, now, in righteousness with the Holy Ghost. And then on the return with Christ, we come back with both physical resurrection and we already got spiritual resurrection. We have a double portion of it. There. Notice how this, that Brother Branham is telling us here, regarding the eternal life, to live in that body, Adam, who was created by God, that eternal life first had to become flesh. Now notice something here, because he writes in this book, referring to that page, he writes, the eternal life had to become flesh. Who was the eternal life there? The tree of life, Christ. Look, the eternal life had to become flesh first 
so that Adam could eat from the tree of life. And there he shows us Revelation 19, 11 to 21, 17, verse 14, and 10, 1 to 11. So, what Adam did not wait for there, today the church bride will be a reality for her. And she, notice that for this end time, the eternal life will be in flesh. On page 302 of the Book of the Seals, When this Holy Spirit that we have, do you see it there? That is the tree of life. That is Christ in his coming. Here he also writes to the left, tree of life. And he continues saying, But before God could raise and save a sinner, he had to have a sinner to raise and save. Man had to fall. The fall, which would be caused by Satan, had to have flesh to make fall. Satan had to come through flesh also. But Satan could not come through human flesh to make the fall as would Christ come in human flesh to restore the fallen. But there was an animal, the serpent, so close to man that Satan could get to that beast. And he writes, the serpent get to that beast, and through that beast he could get to human flesh and cause the fall. Notice, and inject himself thereby into the human race, even as Jesus would one day come and inject himself into the human race, into human bodies, even to the extent of a resurrection wherein we would have bodies like unto his glorious one. Thus, what God worked out here in the garden was his predestinated plan in his first coming to have his image, in his second coming to have his likeness, because in both of them is the tree of life in flesh, is the eternal life in flesh in the midst of the human race. There it was in the midst of the Hebrew people, and here in the midst of the church bride among the Gentiles. And when Satan had brought about that which was necessary to the purpose of God, then man could not get to the tree of life in the garden. Certainly not. It wasn't time. Here he writes, Even to the extent of a resurrection, in this other book of the ages he writes, Resurrection. But an animal? Had caused the fall, had it not? Let animal life be shed. Was taken as his blood shed, and then God had communion with man again. Then there was to come a day when God would appear in flesh, and by means of his humiliation, he would restore fallen man and make him a partaker of that life eternal. Once you see this, you can understand the serpent seed and know that it was no apple Eve ate. No, it was the degradation of humanity by intermingling the seed. And he writes there, the tree of eternal life in flesh. And here, In this other book, where it says, Then man could not get to the tree of life in the garden. Certainly not. It wasn't time. There to the right in this book, he draws a star of David. And he writes, Tree. Revelation 2, verse 7, and 22, verse 14. Now, our brother William goes on to say here in this message, That little book has never before been eaten by a person. It is the title deed of the heavens and the earth. Notice Adam did not eat it. Jesus Christ did not eat it. Notice when he come down from heaven, he brings it in his hand, but he does not eat it. It's the Lamb's book of life. 
It is the book or title deed of eternal life, and it is given to a man who is represented in the Apostle John. Therefore, the man to whom Christ gives it to in the last day will have to be a believer in Christ. In other words, a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where? The second coming of the Lord would be fulfilled. Now, he goes on to say, And the voice from heaven says to him, Ask him who holds the little book open in his hand, ask him for the little book. And John asks him for the little book, and it is given to him. And he says to him, Take it and eat it. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but in your belly it will be bitter. Now notice that, remember in those audios at the beginning, when God was opening the whole picture, and opening the scripture, and showing everything, Notice, everything starts in a progressive way. And it's like when Brother Branham goes to take the gospel to the Hebrews, to the Jews, and he prepares everything. And at Cairo, ready to go there, the angel tells him to go back. He did not have the full revelation there that he had to be, according to Revelation 11. Notice that mystery was open to him. And God showed him at that time that he had to be the two olive trees, Moses and Elijah. He could not be Elijah alone. He had to be with the ministry of Moses. Now, you can see that God doesn't give a prophet everything at once, but he opens up the picture for him. And for example, he may be speaking and saying that something was fulfilled, that which he spoke was fulfilled in him, like David. They pierced my hands and my feet and all that that he spoke. I can count all my bones. And he said, Thou shalt not suffer my body to see corruption and all those things. And anyone thought, even David himself, that 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 he was saying was being fulfilled in him. But he was prophesying of the sufferings of the Messiah. That is, notice that when God began to give us at this end time all the content of what that mystery of the seventh seal is. Notice in those first audios. Remember when I talked to you and said that I was talking to him and he would close his fist and we talk about the title deed. And he said to me with his fist closed and said, I have it. But see, he never put it on his chest or said, I have it here or I ate it. But rather, he always talked to me with his fist closed. Now, notice how all of that was showing what was about to happen in those days, which were very, but very great days. And then God showed me all those things, which I didn't understand before. And when he told me, one of the things there in the hospital that he told me is that is you. And many things that later I understood. And God was opening to us the whole picture of what that title deed was in the midst of the human race and how God would be carrying out that work that he promised to carry out at this end time in the midst of the church that was waiting for the rapture in faith and everything pertaining to that claiming work. Now, notice that it is the only occasion where that title deed was going to be eaten by that prophet and he was going to be given the commandment to prophesy. Adam The title deed was there, and he did not eat it. 
neither did Christ. Now this last one will indeed. And he says, goes on to say, in other words, he will suffer persecutions. There will be misunderstandings about the person because the enemy will persecute him because the title deed will have reached the hands of a man who will have eaten it. And that will mean the end of the kingdom of the Gentiles and the introduction to the kingdom of the Messiah. That man who eats that book will have the divine commission indicated here. That divine commission is given by the angel himself, Revelation 10, 9 to 11. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. Someday, if God allows me to talk about everything that happened that night, there everything would be open. Everything that has stayed in the knowledge of that messenger. Because there are things that we must keep so that imitations don't arise and begin to imitate and hinder the program that God is carrying out in this claiming work. And as he said, there are things that the messenger is going to keep to himself. And later on, if God allows in these bodies to speak clearly those things of which he knows how to work, and on what is based and all those things, then they will be spoken. If not, then when we're transformed. But you see, the important thing is to know that the title deed is in the midst of the human race and that God is carrying out that claiming work in the way he is fulfilling it. And we can say, whether people like it or not, that is the way and form provided by God. The elect will be receiving Everything that God, through that instrument, that human instrumentality, will be bringing to his church, which is the rapturing faith. Now he goes on to say, and he said unto me, take it and eat it up, and he shall make thy belly bitter, but he shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. Remember that that book is an abstract title deed, says Brother Branham. And remember one very important thing, what the revelation is. Now, he keeps saying, And it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. And if he has the order to prophesy, he is a prophet. And the word comes to the prophets. It is the word. He has the final message for all the peoples, nations, and tongues that will exist in this end time. At the time of the coming of this angel and the appearance of the one who eats this little book, who will have the final message of God, the gospel of the kingdom, to preach it to every nation, people, tongues, and individuals. And now, in Revelation 11, a man appears appears here in Revelation 7. Also a man with the seal of the living God, an angel, a messenger, a man with the seal of the living God to call and gather together 144,000 Hebrews, 12,000 from each tribe. And there is where many people tangled up. Since they stumble with the veil of flesh, then they place all of that to a messenger that God has already taken away. No, it's that... When he returns, he will return to that glorified body, adopted and glorified. And in that eternal and immortal glorified body is that he will carry out that work and everything pertaining to the claiming work. One is left, as we say here, dumbfounded with those absurd interpretations. When God always works and everything he has done has worked, works, and will always work, through human instrumentality. But, you see, the chosen of God, by knowing how God works, has worked and will work, will always be looking at the works of the one of whom God said that he would carry out the fulfillment of those prophecies of those promises. And when they see a man fulfilling all of that, 
then they follow as they followed Joshua back then. Well, if God is with you, they told him there, then let's continue forward. Let's continue. Because God has always worked through a messenger. They knew that they were delivered by the pillar of fire manifested in Moses and they were going to be brought into the promised land with a human instrument because if he delivered them with a human instrument he has to bring them into the promised land with a human instrument so for them was no problem the problem was for the others who were left thinking that Moses was going to return or that they had to wait onto the waters to open by themselves without divine direction. Some may have thought that. Or others, no, we have come this far. We're going to wait for Moses to return. But notice, there was a group that was the one that was going to enter into the promised land. And that group was believing that God was always going to work through a prophet and that that prophet was Joshua. He was the one that would bring them into the promised land. For the Lord would do nothing unless he first revealed his secrets to his servants, his prophets. Now he goes on to say here, an angel, a messenger, a man with the seal of the living God, to call and gather together 144,000 Hebrews, 12,000 from each tribe. He comes with the seal of the living God. He comes with the Holy Spirit, which is the seal of the living God. In other words, he comes with Christ in Holy Spirit inside of him because he is the one who receives the promise of Revelation 22, verse 16 and Revelation 2, verse 28. There he speaks to us of the morning star. I will give him the morning star. What he says here, he says, he tells us that To him who overcomes, he says, I will give him the morning star. Revelation 2, verse 28. And Revelation 22, verse 16, Christ says, I am the bright and morning star. In other words, Christ is going to come veiled in that man, in that messenger who will be preaching and calling and gathering together and sealing 144,000 Hebrews, 12,000 from each tribe of the tribes of Israel. That is the one who will make the interlace, the contact with the lost tribes and with the other two tribes, the tribes of Judah and the tribes of Benjamin. And he will be the one who will join the two sticks, the sticks of Judah and the stick of Ephraim. He will bring them together. He will bring those two kingdoms together and thus restore the tribes of Israel for the restoration of the kingdom of David. Now remember that the northern tribes are scattered throughout Latin America and the Caribbean around the entire world. Now, there is something that has not been clearly spoken, openly spoken, of that work of at the last trumpet. That trumpet, and he shall send his angels with a great voice of the trumpet, and they shall gather together the elect. Those elect are the 144,000 Hebrews. Now, notice where and when those 144,000 Jews are gathered together. That is, those hundred, let us see, those 120,000 who are from the northern tribes and who are among Christianity and those 24,000 who belong to the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Now, let us continue Because the work that God is carrying out is so great in favor of the bride, in favor of the 144,000, and also for that denominational world and the lost, because the third pole is for all the groups. That of nine things. How does it tell us in the book of the seals? On page 19, it says, Many miss him by the way he reveals himself. Now, man has their own ideas of what God ought to be and what God is going to do. And as I have made the old statement many times, that man still remain man. 
Man is always giving God praise for what he did do, and always looking forward to what he would do, and ignoring what he is doing. See? See? That's the way they miss it. They look back and see what a great thing he done, but they fail to see what a simple thing he used to do it with. See? And they look forward and see the great thing coming that's going to happen. And nine times out of ten is already happening right around them. And it's so simple that they don't know it. See? Notice the things that were spoken that would happen at the end of time. Many have been fulfilled. Others are being fulfilled. They are being fulfilled. And this is the work that God is doing. And the next ones are about to happen. And many overlook it. Why? Because of the simple way in which God fulfills them. Now, notice it says, Let's read it again, this little paragraph. That is the one who will make the interlace, the contact with the lost tribes and with the other two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And he will be the one who will join the two sticks, the stick of Judah and the stick of Ephraim. He will bring them together. He will bring those two kingdoms together and thus restore the tribes of Israel for the restoration of the kingdom of David. And in that man, in that man, well... He has to have a veil of flesh. The messengers who were on earth and fulfilled the work pertaining to their time, to that ministry, and left, God has already finished dealing with them. That, when the people who have not yet understood that mystery understand it well and realize it, there is when many will come repented. And they will realize the time they have wasted. But thanks to God that the chosen ones of God are making good use of the time and eating that food, eating of that tree of life, so that soon all that word be incarnate in them. And soon the fullness of God will be in them. And in that man will be the Holy Spirit, Christ in Holy Spirit, operating the ministry of Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. Because the only one who has ministries, operates ministries, is the Holy Spirit. There is no one else who has and operates ministries. And now we can see that a big event is about to take place at the same time. But in the meantime, the door is still open. See, there he is already saying that this great event is about to take place in the end time. That had not happened in the time of our brother Branham, nor in the time of our brother William, it says. But in the meantime, the door of mercy remains open so that everyone who hears the preaching of the gospel of Christ may have the faith of Christ born in his soul, believe in Christ with all his heart, and receive Him as His only and sufficient Savior. That is under the dispensation of grace that was being lived before the door of mercy closes, before Christ changes from high priest to judge, before He changes from high priest to king and judge. Therefore, before Christ, the mighty angel that descends from heaven in Revelation 10, takes the title deed in heaven, opens it, and does his claiming work, and brings the book, the title deed, and delivers it to a man who eats it, to prophesy over many people, nations, and tongues. Notice, Christ will be in that man. Christ in Holy Spirit will be in that man, speaking to all mankind. And he will be speaking to them as king, as lion. That is why he will also be speaking to them about the divine judgment that are to come upon the human race during the Great Tribulation. Many people will see a man, but many others will see that Christ will be in that man speaking to his church and to all mankind. But that man will not be Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ will be in him speaking to him and working through him. We are very close to that time where there will be a change in heaven, which will carry out a change here on the planet Earth. This situation of climate problems is prophetic. 
Notice in the Book of the Seals, page 133, our brother Branham tells us, it says, at the beginning, it says, on page 133, there where it says, the Lamb's blood paid the price. It thunders when he spoke it out, and when he did, a white horse rider started out, and it still was a symbol. Now watch, he said it would be known in the last day, but it comes forth in a church symbol. Do you understand it? Now, many people think, when they don't have the revelation, they think that the symbols is the reality, or they think that the types and figures is the fulfillment. And for them, that is what shines. And for them, that shines brighter than the reality. For them, the reality, the fulfillment of that, for them it means nothing. And the types and figures means more than the reality, than the fulfillment. The type and figure shines more for them, the symbols, the shadows, than the reality. Because they are not seen behind the veil. The chosen one sees behind the veil and sees the greatness of the reality, of the fulfillment of what that prophecy comes to be quickened, brought to life, not in types and figures, but the reality. And they, when they see it, although they see it simple and its fulfillment simple, they see the greatness that is behind it. The unbeliever and the make-believer sees it and says, no, that's not it, it can't be. They keep the type and figure with the symbols, the shadows, For them, that is what shines the brightest. There is where the filio or brotherly love is. And the agapao love is in the chosen ones looking at the fulfillment. Because they see behind the veil. Understand it? Church, it comes forth in a symbol of a church. That they know there is a seal. But just what it is, yet they don't know because it's a white horse rider and only is to be revealed at the last day when this actual seal is broken. Broken to who? Not to Christ, but to the church. And he writes there, the seal is broken not to Christ, but to the church. Notice now, oh my, that just makes me tremble. I hope the church truly understands it. What I mean, you people, I'm going to call you bride, see, that you'll understand it. The voice is a thunder. And he writes, the voice equals a thunder. The voice came from where? From the throne where the Lamb had just left, as intercessor. Now, he is standing here to take his position and his claims. But the thunder came from the inside of the throne, thundered out, and the Lamb was standing out here. The thunder where the Lamb had left, left the Father's throne to go to take his own throne. And he writes, the age of the cornerstone. And also to the left, he writes, the position. Now his own throne, that throne is the throne of David, because he comes as son of man and son of David. And he says that above, that is, in heaven, on that mercy seat, on that throne, when this happens, there is already no mercy. And... If he comes to another throne, that is, his own throne, there is where, notice what we read on page 103, that the tree of life, of eternal life, becoming flesh, see? And there is that that new mercy seat is where the ministries of Moses and Elijah, the one who receives them, receives mercy as he wrote there in the book of the seals. Now he goes on to say, Glory now, now don't miss it, friends. Notice, he's warning them there. Now don't miss it. We all know as Christians that God swore to David that he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne and give him an everlasting kingdom here on earth. He did it. And Jesus said, He that overcomes the Antichrist, 
and all the things of the world shall sit with me on my throne, as I have overcome and have sit down on my Father's throne. See, now, someday he rises from the Father's throne and he goes to take his own throne. Now, he comes forth to call his subjects. There is the work of the one who eats that little book and told to prophesy over many people and nations and tongues. Now, he comes forth to call his subjects. How is he going to claim them? He's already got the book of redemption in his hand. Glory. Oh, I feel like singing a hymn. And he writes there, the Father's throne, the Son's throne. Now, how is he going to claim? He says, he already has the book of redemption in his hand. And what does he do with that book of redemption in his hand? He gives it to a man to eat it. And there he carries out that claiming work. How is he going to claim them? How is the Lord going to carry out that claiming work? Well, by giving that title to that man. And that man carrying out the claiming work. There he writes, The overcomers sit on his throne, the church and Israel. There are the two sticks. Now, well, he also writes there below, Some day that is still to come, and he draws an arrow toward a cornerstone that he draw and the ages. Now he goes on to say further on on the same message, Therefore, we are going to see a very important interlace that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will make through a messenger, a prophet at the end time. For they are waiting for a prophet. They are waiting for the prophet Elijah who will come proclaiming the everlasting peace and who will be the true forerunner of the coming of the Messiah. That is why they have not received other preachers, others who have tried to convert them to Christianity. They know who they are waiting for, because Malachi 4 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That is, before the great tribulation comes. That is, before the great tribulation comes. before that terrible time arrives for the human race, but so glorious for the believers in Christ. Now we have thus seen in this short chat everything pertaining to that tree of life in flesh. The tree of life in flesh, of which he wrote there in that part of that page 112 of the ages 109 and 110 of the other book where he wrote there the tree of life in flesh tomorrow we will also be seeing some portions that speak to us about those two sticks as far as God allow us to speak so that we can continue to receive that rapturing faith which God is bringing to the church bride, the tree of life in flesh. It has been for me a privilege and a great blessing to be able to share with you these moments of fellowship around the Word of God and all that pertains to His claiming work, the tree of life in flesh. May God bless you, may God keep you, And we will see each other tomorrow, God willing, in tomorrow's activity, where we hope that God will speak to us as always, directly to our souls, to our hearts, and that much word be incarnate in our lives. May God bless you and keep you all.